Okay, well, thank you, um, the conference and the organisers um, for bringing us all here together for the um, second Fast Forward conference. And uh, it would be nice to, I think, to address, as well as our panel here, um, some of the remarks that um, Daniela and Anna made as well. So I think when we open the discussion up, it would be very nice if um, some questions or thoughts were directed towards them too, because um, Fast Forward is, is probably... There are lots of small to women's organisations but um, for photography, but I think fast forward to me it feels as if it's, it's kind of done the most at the moment and it's um, breaking a lot of new ground. And I think when you break new ground as well, you, um, you disturb things and that's, that's the whole principle of breaking new ground. And I was very interested to hear Anna talking about Tate Modern and the 50% um, women uh, artists who are now being included in the shows there as a matter of policy. I mean, that's, that's very interesting. I curated a show for Tate Britain, not Tate Modern, in 2007, and Susan Bright and I, who were the co-curators, um, made our own policy that it was going to be 50% women, which um, caused no problem at all. But what causes more problems, I think, when you're dealing with big establishment art galleries is lack of provenance because most big um, art galleries and museums um, will rely very much on other on authentication. So if, if an artist doesn't have a gallery, this is one of the things we found when we were doing that show. It didn't matter though whether they were a man or a woman, they didn't have a gallery. And for a major museum, that's a real problem because the question is why not? And lots of artists in Britain in 2007 and still now don't have the kind of galleries that those kind of institutions will recognise as having authenticated things. So I just want to throw that into the pot. This isn't just about women, this is about the way photography is perceived, which photography is taken up by which galleries and which photography isn't. And it, I think it would be really interesting to know from our panel here, um, and I think Anna should also be sitting up here really, with everybody else. <laughs> I think it would be really interesting to know how these kind of photographers, it sounds very bold, but how do they make a living? You know, how, do they, how do they construct their careers so that they're surviving on photography? I mean, do people buy their work? Do they teach? I mean, that, that's, that's very interesting, I think. So maybe we could just go around, and I want to open it up really soon, but I think one or two questions maybe would, would be good. So should we just pass around? Na, mano atveju tarpukario dailininkės tarpukario dailininkės iš fotografijos neužsidirbo, bent Veronika Šleivytė kažkokius nedidelius honorarius publikuodama nuotraukas spaudoje, bet jos gyveno iš su dailio susijusių susijusio uždarbio. Kadangi tai ankstyvos laikotarpius ir fotografija nei, nei tuo metu ir kiek žinau ir dabar jų nuotraukos na, nėra pardavinėjamos. So I speak about uh, photographers in our country, women photographers. Um, the, I think um, it's, it's a little bit um, difficult to be a photographer in this time. Um, because um, uh, so many editorial offices uh, have no um, staff photographers. And uh, so many publishing houses have no staff photographers. So uh, majority of uh, photographers are freelance. And uh, they are looking for work, of course. And um, 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 fortunately, uh, we have a lot of photo schools, so photographers can teach. 
and uh, what I have no idea what uh, what will be with uh, those students who f who will finish the school, who will be photographers without work. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I I I believe that uh, classical photography. Uh, will be alive in future and uh, because I see it uh, when when we organize a huge exhibition interesting exhibition in Prague so we have a lot of visitors of that so people are thirsty to see really good works in photography uh, so and we have so young visitors, old visitors, uh, children visitors. Um, so I, I believe it will be okay <laughs> in future. <laughs> so. Um, so situation is in former Yugoslavia. I mean, I can speak mostly about the situation in Croatia, but I would say that uh, in the former Yugoslav republics, the situation is quite similar. So, uh, in the previous periods, because uh, before 1990, there wasn't any academic level where you, where you can enroll and uh, learn about photography. Uh, the situa situation now it's a bit better because of the Academy of Dramatic Art. They have a photography department, uh, MA studies. Uh, on the humanistic level and the philosophical faculties, uh, there is almost um, any um, um, notion about photography, contemporary photography as such. So this is also uh, very important because we somehow I didn't have opportunity to, to erase the scene of critical thoughts and uh, the editions, uh, and we don't have them so many. Uh, there is no art market, so we don't have uh, um, galleries who are selling arts, neither photography, so if anyone wants to buy anything, so they, they have to approach photographers and buy in, the, in their ateliers or their private spaces. And uh, the situation was that most of them, they've been um, making, um, earning their um, um, uh, living, um, for a living uh, during the, uh, working for the media houses, for the newspapers. Uh, some of them have been um, uh, collaborating with the major uh, theater houses as the stage photographers or for the television sets. Um, and I would say for, for many photographers, even now, the situation is really very, very complicated. They have to do um, uh, any kind of jobs to, to earn the money. And, uh, and I would say that many of um, uh, those uh, artists uh, then produce their own works, artistic works, out of that money. So there are always lack of money in, in, in any case. And, I don't know if any photographer, and here we can we can ask uh, maybe someone from practitioners uh, to say something uh, different than me. But I would say the situation it's really hard, and we still have a lot of things to do in our society. Well, in fact, I have to to say that in Latvia it's it's almost the same, uh, almost no art market in general. Uh, there are just uh, a few collectioners, so they also can't buy all of the artworks. Uh, the grant system is also very poor, uh, so all the photographers and in fact all the artists also from other spheres, they have to make their living from working somewhere else, mainly in uh, advertisement agencies or theaters or something like that. So it's like uh, unbelievable, but this is the fact that they have to earn their money somewhere just to make an artwork. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Well, I must say that in Poland it's a bit different. I mean, uh, those uh, artists that I show are uh, definitely like stars, 
so they were acquired, for example, Natalia Lal even to like Tate collection. So they're having like a, a lot of interest in the, among Polish collectors, but also collectors from abroad. And I must say there is a certain fashion uh, for collecting Central European uh, feminist avant-garde uh, in the region, but also in the West. So it's kind of trendy to have the artists who are uh, very liberal uh, and very leftist in the even in former Yugoslavia, like Sanya Ivakovic or you know Jata Bratescu from Romania recently. So in this generation, I think this, the situation is pretty good, and they are selling um, and they are having a lot of money. But the problem, of course, when, is when it comes to younger generation, because uh, the market, the art market, is very brutal. So you are in or out. So and it's not touching really the gender uh, issue, no, but. Uh, um, you know, it's very hard to be in the market for young uh, female artists. However, I must say what is very uh, interesting is that women themselves, because, uh, um, you know, this communist times were, it was kind of oppressive, but it was also very conservative. So the academies of fine arts were dominated by men. Now the situation is changing, but even today in Poland there is more female professors in the theology department than in fine arts department, so which is uh, uh, kind of telling. Uh, but uh, the women um, or female artists, they develop their own system. So like Sofia Kulik or Natalia Eller, they are um, like taking some kind of apprenticeship. So it's like a, a young generation artists who are helping them uh, with their daily life and work. And at the same time being introduced to the, uh, to the art world and being somehow trained in many ways, technical, but also like having lectures or planners together. And so like photographers, but also artists uh, that are doing this sort of thing, including, for example, Paulina Wolska, who's not really a photographer. So this is like a kind of sisterhood, and, um, and it's intergenerational, which I kind of find interesting. And I would also like to add one more thing, because it's not only about women, but uh, it's also about like LGBTQ, so to speak. Yeah? So for example, Natalia Allard is a uh, big figure for the uh, gay and queer semi uh, of Kulik uh, movement. So it's not only about women's position in, the, uh, in today's uh, world of art or uh, culture in general. Shall I just talk about myself? <laughs> I'm just in experience of talking to various women photographers. I mean, I think photography is a very precarious career to be a photographer, so, so um, it's difficult for everybody. Uh, and one of the things, um, you know, people uh, build up their careers through doing different things, from teaching to commercial practice to uh, printing um, to doing other things um, to being assistants and, and what have you. And one of the things that I think that I've spoken to many women about is the difficulty of doing things like commercial work, particularly um, if you have, uh, if you just had children or if you have small children, because the commercial world doesn't have any tolerance for people who say they can't come today for whatever reason. And most of the societies we seem to live in, apart from Scandinavia, have, uh, I, I don't know really what it's like in the Baltics and the Balkans, but have really uh, poor, really poor childcare uh, on offer. In the UK, it's uh, appalling. Um, so unless you earn a lot of money, and, and, or have some kind of private income or a wealthy partner, it's very unlikely that you could just be a photographer. Um, having said that, there's a lot of photography education in Britain, and so a lot of, and that's a great place for a photographer involved in the art-based environment to work in, because it's um, sort of cutting-edge ideas, if you like, working with young people and colleagues involved in writing, thinking, and doing photography, photographic practice. Um, and I think the most successful uh, position for women to occupy is to have some kind of fractional post, some kind of half-time post with a university or a college um, so that they have half the time to make their own work. And it's sort of almost affordable to do that. Just during coffee break, so one hour ago, so uh, suddenly Arthur Allman uh, appeared here, uh, who uh, is a director of Museum of Contemporary Photography in San Diego, or was, <laughs> uh, California, and 
I remember when I visited his museum in San Diego, uh, I asked him at that time, it was 1988, uh, Alfred, how you can raise money for your museum? And he told me that time, oh, you'll learn it when in your country, in Czechoslovakia, you will have some rich people in future. So, uh, I can say now that, yes, in Czechoslovakia now we have some rich people. And uh, fortunately, he, they understand that photography is a very good collectioner um, investment, you see. So the most rich man in our country, I don't name him, uh, he founded uh, the fund uh, for uh, photography, for buying photography, and now he has the most interesting collection of photography and uh, other people are appearing, fortunately, so we have some hope. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. I just, um, you know, looking back at my notes, I'm, I'm absolutely overwhelmed by the work that I've seen, most of which um, I've never seen before. I'm trying to, it's too short a time to try and make any sense of these strands and these different histories. How much are they influenced by nationality? How much are they influenced by the idea of the Soviet bloc? Um, to me, they're all jumbled at the moment, but I, I think what we saw was just quite remarkable. And somehow, you know, it's so, we'd so much like to see it sort of put together or brought to Britain or, you know, exposed to a wider audience because I found all the work incredibly exciting. Um, but I'm, I'm confused um, by all the different kinds of things. But when I look back at my notes and hopefully look up some websites, it, it will all start to make sense. Um, I think it would be really nice to, I know there's some curators here from Oracle as well and, and as well as our audience, I think it would be great to throw this open now to the floor because we've got a, an incredible set of people here who you know, we may never be able to bring together again for you to um, exchange views and ask questions. So I'm going to throw it open now. It's a question for um, Adam, and um, you mentioned, I thought very interestingly, about trends. And of course, uh, Natalia um, LL was, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll start again. Uh, you mentioned trends and things becoming trendy. And I noted that in the uh, Photo London, our big photo fair, uh, Natalia LL had a one person kind of presentation in, in that uh, um, exhibition, um, in that fair, and sold very well, as, as you say, in collections. And I think that's a danger also, of course, that you've all noted, that when you have fashions, you can go in and out of fashion. So it's just an observation, really, about how work gets picked up and how some work gets neglected that shouldn't be. And of course, if it goes into a collection, then it has a, another life. So that's why it's really important seeing all the work that you all show, because you know we'll get progressed, and you know hopefully then they will start appearing in all the places where people collect and buy. But it is about a market as well. So thank you very much uh, for raising that. Well, of course, this is very ambiguous, but I think uh, we all know that today the art market is uh, overwhelming to some extent, especially for women artists. It's crucial to be there. Uh, I mean, it's uh, like if we are talking to be in or out, this is uh, uh, success in the art market is crucial. 
So uh, uh, in this sense, uh, I was showing these two uh, artists also on purpose because, for example, Zofia Kulik is somehow taking a step back and she's rather avoiding this sort of situation, not really wanting to be part of this uh, system, even though the galleries and the dealers are putting a lot of pressure on, uh, on the artists. So uh, uh, each and every artist uh, who's in the position may have to make this kind of choices, but uh, if the question was how they are doing, they, they can say, okay, I'm in or out, but uh, in many cases, the younger artists don't have this choice. So once, once you are in the, having the, the established career, you can, you can do whatever you want. Um, but Natalia Lelis, I think, very wisely played with this uh, presence in the art market, especially that she is also having a dealer who's a woman, and she's supporting also the younger artists. They are uh, exhibiting with each other, which is also very crucial, is because if she's recognized and she's inviting other artists, gay, queer, you know, uh, uh, lesbian or young generation doing whatever, then they immediately have some recognition. So uh, I kind of like this uh, way of work. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's really interesting, but it's, I guess the thing that aids artists most, women or men, is the, the kind of system in the Nordic countries where you're, you're given that time and space to develop, aren't you, without having to rely, you know, on, on collectors and art fairs to, to kind of promote your work. And, and that, I think that's, that's such an awful lottery. I think our education system in Britain, our teaching system, does it a little bit, but you still have to teach, whereas in Sweden, now, there are these artist fellowships that you can have for a number of years and, and that's a tremendously strong photographic culture where people seem to be able to just do things slowly and there is something, I, I don't know, I guess I'm a Puritan, but there is something kind of slightly frightening about all some of the amazing work you've been showing suddenly being kind of pounced on somehow and, and, and you know, become collectible. Um, so it's the great dichotomy, isn't it, of art? You know, artists need to be collected in order to survive, but when they are collected, it's only a very tiny proportion of artists who become collected. And sometimes, I guess, in the in the case of um, somebody like Esko Manico in Finland, he becomes representative of the Finnish documentary photographer, whereas there are many others. So it's a very imperfect science, isn't it? The the, the position of artists as you know, by the fact that they're collected, if you, I mean, if you compare that with literature or, or any other sort of art form, that's a really strangely impermanent way of, of, um, of kind of creating a system, isn't it? Yeah, it's more also a reflection of the question. <laughs> I believe that uh, in Lithuania it's more like um, uh, photographers who were recognized as important historically. They are being bought. But for young people, I don't know who could buy them, <laughs> for men and women in this thing. So it's some kind of strange situation that only safe um, ways are working at, at the moment. So it, it would be interesting to know from you, or is it, for example, in England, something, is there a platform that allow young photographers to work uh, and to, to earn money? I mean, I agree exactly with what um, Val just said about the art marketplace. It's a real problem, um, and it's not something to be relied on. It's obviously important, but it's a problem. Uh, and one of the things I know that we have um, in the UK, and I know in France, probably, possibly in Germany, I don't know, um, are quite a lot, quite a few commissions. So, um, I mean, I, the first thing I did when I left university is, is get a commission to make work, and I've, um, 
you know, if, if I wasn't um, full time in a university, I, I, that's the first thing I would do is look for more commissions to make work. And sometimes you're invited to do them, and sometimes you apply to do them, but they definitely consider young people. But one of the, first, the second commission I ever got was really important for me in terms of developing um, practice, and I was up against some of the top photographers in the UK, and, and I got it. So there's a definite sort of sense of um, looking at people from all different um, stages of their career. And definitely as well, the UK Arts Council um, looks at emerging people as well as established people. Um, so I don't know what you have, uh, what there is in Lithuania or the rest of the Baltics, but I, I think this is probably the same in Scandinavia, um, uh, Northern Europe certainly, uh, Spain as well. Um, and those, are, those I think, are right not to be underestimated, commissions, because they're um, not as good as the artist salary or fellowship that you might get in Sweden, Sweden or, or Finland or used to be able to get in the Netherlands, but they at least give you like between 12 and 24 months to develop a body of work. Um, there's usually an exhibition or a publication at the end of it, so there is some kind of pressure, if you like, but it's still quite a lot of time. Um, and they definitely consider new people. Um, I have actually a question, two different questions, one to Yevar and one to Jana. Um, you have a question, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because there was a translation of your talk. Um, you mentioned that the women who you present is the work, they obviously they kind of call themselves as amateur uh, photographers, and they um, they haven't kind of been um, recorded in a history in a way, or something exposed themselves um, as a, a artist, the photographers. So is it in a way I would like to, if you can expand a bit more of that. So are they now sort of in the history of that, and are they um, equally presented? in a way, or it's still, because you present that paper, it's still a question if looking kind of in, in, uh, in Lithuania. That's, like, if it, if it makes sense for you. Then. And uh, for Jana, I'm interested, very interested, like, it's my personal interest to this last uh, work you show, Vika Extra. So for me, it's interesting more like we sit now in a context, obviously, um, women in photography, and we see there is a, it's a kind of, in a way, there is a humor in that work, but for me, it's interesting if there is any other discussions, and even including uh, uh, the men visitors, like viewers, how they react on that sort of work and what sort of discussions, um, not just the feminist side of, of it, or like both, if there is any kind of controversy around that work, or what, what sort of debates this work raised anyway. That would be interesting for me to know. Thank you. Galėčiau atsakyti, kad tos tarpų, kurio menininkės, apie kurios skaičiau pranešimą, jau dabar yra tos tarpų, kurio dailininkės, apie kurios skaičiau pranešimą, jau yra įrašytos į Lietuvos fotografijos 20 amžiaus pirmosios pusės istoriją, bet tai vyko neseniai ir pagrindinėse, paskutinėje jau tokio rimtoje fotografijos ontologijoje yra ir išleivytės ir dancelės darabildienės pavardės, ko pasigeščiau ir manau dar trūksta rimtesnių leidinių skirtų šioms dailininkėms. Nesutikra ar vakar prospekto galerijoje galėtų apžiūrėti domicelės tarabildienės fotografijų porą, na, iš tiesų kuklių katalogėlių. Veronikos Šleivytės kūrybinis palikimas yra jam žildas viename irgi kukliame leidinėlyje, kuriame yra dėl visios nuotraukų publikuota. Šleivytės palikimas iš tiesų fotografinis labai gausus ir manau, kad būtų galima kalbėti, galvoti apie kažkokį monumentalesnį leidinį. Urbana Vičiutė subačiuvenė į Lietuvos fotografijos istoriją 
Ir daugiau, kaip antrą pasaulinio karo metų Vilniaus fotografija, kuri fiksavo karo padarytą žalą Vilniaus architektūrinėms žiniausiams paminklams. Well, about Rika Ekstra, I have to say that today you had the honor to be the first ones to have uh, to see the public presentation of this series, because uh, and also we can guess why the artist has started to work on this uh, like six years ago, but for some reasons she considered that this series is not complete or not su successful, and she has even removed this from her web page. But I remember that she once had had habit. So I contacted her and said, hey, where, is, where are these men? Where have they disappeared? She said, well, yes, I have this series. Oh, okay, yes, maybe I should work on them more. And, and then after some time, like uh, some months later, she said, okay, I have uh, rearranged the material and I think now it's more or less ready. And if you want, you can use it for your presentation. So she had uh, so far only shown it to her friends, and as she told me this, um, especially this first image, if you remember this drunk man with some missing teeth, with this big, a bit blurred image, say that most people, they were afraid of this image. And she said, but why? He's so funny. I met him in a, on a train, and I probably will never see him again. And, and then I remember how she talked. He reminded me of a baby who had had too much milk. <laughs> okay, and at that point when she said this, I realized that my own fear, which I also experienced toward this man, has somehow diminished. And I thought, okay, maybe I can include it in my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. I only don't believe that East European uh, men look like that man you showed us. I don't believe it. <laughs> Some of them do. Some of them do. Some of them do. Well, but they say not all, but some yes. And this series is about this kind of uh, macho style, which is still very much present in especially countryside communities, where indeed drinking, uh, hard labor, work, very uh, uh, primitive interest in how to spend your life, but also very limited uh, possibilities to do something else because you don't have education, you don't have money, and you have to do your living. We definitely have them in our village, for sure, yeah. I go to the pub with them. I mean, it feels to me as somebody who's coming to most of this work, apart from some of the work that Daniela mentioned, as completely new, as I say, it's, you know, I can figure this, this um, kaleidoscope of images flashing through my brain now. Um, I mean, it would be great if they could be published, wouldn't it? And we could have, you know, we could have books of some of these photographers, especially some of those early women using abstraction, because that's so relevant to the kind of photography that's really on the rise in Britain at the moment, is, you know, the return to analog. Uh, alternative photography methods. I mean, it would be a wonderful. Um, it would be wonderful to be able to access that work for lots of different people, not people like us who are, you know, lucky to be able to come to these kind of events, but all sorts of people who would love to see it. So it would be fantastic to see that work being published. I think so that you know, so even on a website, so that we can kind of remember it. Oh, sorry. Just wanted to make another point that I thought was very interesting that was brought up. It's about curating, and it's about people wanting no names, which is why often you see shows with you know key artists that are kind of like familiar friends, you could say, so that to to pull an audience in. But what I think is 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 great. There are quite a few curators here, and you can curate shows where. You can have your, if you like, your headliners, but then you introduce these wonderful new people that people haven't seen. And I think 
that's why conferences like this are so important because they introduce other audiences and provoke them to think about, you know, whether it's masculinity taken by female artists or whether it's um, portraits of a baby, um, which in itself is, at the moment, uh, portraits of children or babies is a controversial subject matter um, in terms of all the, you know, all the publicity around how we take images. So I think that it's fantastic to be exposed by, you know, to these images. And also, you were talking about magazines and how important magazines become to bring work to other places where you can't see the exhibitions, even though we have masses of stuff online. I mean, magazines are really important. And that history, that magazine you were talking about, Fantastic how many people we're talking about, how many people saw that magazine and it influenced them. So, you know, that's to be hugely celebrated, I think. Thank you. Still working? Okay. Um, I guess three things popped into my head. I have one question and then listening to other things. You mentioned we have men like that in my village, right? And, uh, and I think I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, the quote, quote unquote, women like that in my village, you know, who also maybe don't have the education, have a kind of subsistence day by day reality. And um, I wouldn't mind focusing on that, which, which made me think of a title that uh, unsimilarly related, which might be Traces of manhood in contemporary Latvian women, uh, maybe, something like that. Um, okay, I've forgotten the second one. And then <laughs> the third one comes from Val's introduction, where you seemed to suggest that there's parallels between the role of women in photography and the role of photography in the arts. and. Uh, Often we have separate, we've had separate institutions, we've had separate conferences, you know, various other things, but in the meantime, in a lot of Western countries, museums are merging everything um, and not making separations. Um, while well, at the same time, as countries are busy separating themselves from, from what was once one country. And uh, so what I'm wondering is, from all of you, is if you, if you look forward to a time when uh, the separate focuses cease to exist or be important, or do you see them as continuing to be significant and, and having an important future? You mean separate between photography and the other arts, or separate between men and women? Both, but uh, yeah, both. Well, I mean, I fear the day when photography isn't, doesn't have some level of separation, because I think that there's an immense knowledge of photographic histories which you know don't exist in a general art institution a general art museum and specialist curators i think are incredibly important um whether they'll disappear or not i don't know one or two key people have disappeared in britain already um you know been um don't work anymore um i don't know i mean there's some curators here who would also have a a view on that, but in my my point of view, the specialist photography curator is hugely important, and I think it is a separate medium. I've always thought so, and I'll continue to to think that. Uh, the men and women question, I think, is kind of complicated as well. By somebody was saying about the idea of queer art, I mean, I think that's hugely important, and we haven't we haven't discussed that today. Um, so. I just, I suppose all my life has been trying to make photography visible so that we can make our own minds up about what we think about it rather than having it so hidden. And I'd be really interested to know, there's some of the work you've mentioned, I know some of the work Daniela mentioned is, is, you know, is quite well known, but is this work, are you talking about work that's obscure in your own countries or is it just us from the outside who are, you know, just ignorant? That would that, be interesting to know. What was your third question? It hasn't come back to me yet, no. <laughs> well, I think it's a very important question to this conference. And uh, 
I must say that um, I was nervous when I was here because it's the conference like any other, not like any other, that you have so many like uh, women focusing on this uh, particular issue. And recently, you know, in Poland we had this research concerning uh, exhibitions of women art. And uh, scholars were very uh, pessimistic because they realized that they are in a kind of ghetto um, of the, like I said, preferential you know, exhibitions of women on women about women issues, so to speak. And it turns out that it's going to nowhere. And so in my opinion, I would be like in opposition to what you said, that I like museums that are deleting this or like erasing this difference between photography and art. And both of the artists that I showed, I, I think they would never ever be happy to hear that they are not artists but photographers. They are artists, yes, even though they are using this photography. This is one thing, but another is that the, the artists themselves are also, like, even though they are very eminent, they are very often skeptical uh, of becoming only a part of the feminist discourse, which is also interesting to see how they uh, reflect. For example, in Polish or in the Slavic languages, we have these differences, yes, of uh, artista, artistka, so like two versions of the same word for a woman and a man, and they are not saying they, they, they don't want to be called in this feminine mode, yes only uh, as a man artist, which is kind of also telling, and, uh, and, I, and I hope that one day we'll have known this difference that everybody will be an artist, uh, uh, like in English you have, yes, uh, that's a man or woman or a gay or heterosexual photographer or, or an artist without uh, this sort of uh, uh, you know, divisions. So I think this kind of uh, events are leading us to this bright future of uh, uh, Lines, like uh, museums showing uh, different stuff, not calling this photography or art, men or women. I was, I would like to give comment on your first remark, which I was all the time thinking for now. And for now, I, would, I have a feeling that I would love to see images of uh, middle-aged, overweight, drunk women going to forest big berries in their underwear. I think it would be very, very lovely and very powerful. And especially in the context of what we have seen today in the previous presentations, which were very um, interesting and uh, uh, valuable. But have you noticed that these images of women which we have seen today, uh, these artists' self-portraits, or uh, portraits of other women, uh, like imitating uh, stars uh, or just making their own images, that they were all like one type, more or less. They were all young, thin, with very good body, with perfect body, uh, with sexy body, in different way, of course, and different variations, but what we have is so far seen. And that's why it would be just wonderful if Finally, we would have this uh, elegance that somebody would say, okay, go, go fat, a drunk woman, and show yourself. You don't have to be always thin, perfect, beautiful. Yes? And, and, what, and what would happen? Everybody would say, oh, look at her. She's awful. She's this horrible no, woman who nobody knows. Maybe no. But maybe yes. And the risk is very high. And do you want to risk? I mean, yes, there are, of course. Yes, there are, but they are not the majority. And if we, if we see that this cultural field is all connected, that photography, like in museum, is connected with photography we see in newspaper, in advertisements, in, in, in popular culture, then we see this trend, it's still very much that women always have to look perfect. And men, for some reason, have this chance, the privilege, to look like we have seen in the Epic's series. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether who was there for the panel discussion last night, but we discussed a book called Girl on Girl, which was very much kind of critiqued for you know everybody in that was young and very attractive and that was it was the Instagram, you know, the Instagram generation, I, I guess you could call it if you were being crude. Um, and um, but I can think of countless examples of, you know, from Joe Spence onwards of women who, you know, have really portrayed themselves in this, 
Yeah, and Joe Spence is probably one of the most influential artists of our time, but maybe that's what women are reacting against, you know. And the girl on girl, maybe they're reacting against that. I mean, who, who, who knows? I think it's a, a big discussion. And those portraits of men are very tender, that way. Yes. Yeah. I've seen a lot of pictures of drunk men and drunk women and all sorts of different people pictured. And, and the interesting thing about those images is the tenderness of them, like you you sort of said about the baby <laughs> idea, which is quite funny. But I, I thought they were quite pretty unusual because of that. That's why I thought they were interesting. She was alone in the forest, so it was collaboration. Yeah, it's quite... Um, but interesting, I, I agree with her that photography has to be a separate subject, because if you, if you separate art-based photography from the rest of the history of photography, you've immediately got a problem. I mean, photography is interesting because it goes into all these different areas. It's not just about art. Um, so you're immediately in danger if you separate it, I think, of missing something enormous. And the thing about gender as well, I would like to think that we wouldn't necessarily have to have these kinds of conversations in, in 10 years' time, and maybe this whole notion of gender fluidity will change all that. I'm afraid we're almost out of time, so if we could finish now and to come back to these questions after the break during the second discussion. So thank you to all the participants.